going to talk about who, where, why, and what can be done. Too often we talk about a problem and never propose a solution. So I'm going to propose some solutions today. Um, and so you're going to be franked uh, today, a version of education. I don't think I have a, um, a, an advancer. Oh, is it up there? All right. It should be. I, I agree it should be. Oh, is, oh, here it is. Right there. All right, good deal. Thank you. It's pretty hard to give an hour talk or a half hour talk from one slide. We're so unused to that. Um, okay, so I've given you the contact information yesterday. Just talked with a a person is actually going to Starkville today because she's moved to Starkville and that's actually where I'm going as well, Sydney. Um, so this is what you saw yesterday. Maybe your feedback will be that I, I'm like a longhorn cow, a point here and a point there and a lot of bull in between. Um, we're going to talk about the various levels involved. You know, we're all products of the society we live in, the particular environment we live in, and that all of the, both the society and the environment, and the emotional and social environment, all modify our health behaviors and cause disease. It's sort of foolish to think that we can just exist in our own little ecological niche, sort of separate from the larger society or larger community. I think we don't talk enough about, and Marissa was referring to this today, we don't talk enough about policy. You know, if you really want to make major change, whether it be in health care or in any kind of issue, you really have to talk about policy. We can do a lot of changes at the margin, but it's about policy, it's about taxation, it's about incentives for people to do healthier things. And that was our most effective way to improve health outcomes. We're going to give you a brief overview on a patient presentation, obesity outcomes and their geographic distribution. We're going to talk about uh, how place matters, that is where we live and where we work and where we attend school and where we play. We're going to talk about education, health and wealth. I think that that every one of you has pursued some advanced education beyond high school and probably you're all in graduate school or you know completed graduate school we all recognize that there's a relationship between education and wealth uh, and then there's a relationship between wealth and health and those are very strong relationships and persistent relationships we can talk about health outcomes in our nation, our Al in Alabama, and even in Jefferson County. We can talk about determinants of health outcomes. And then importantly, how are we going to communicate about some better health care? And how are we going to facilitate better health care for people? Is there a business case to support this? And so uh, along that line, I did bring a hat today which Stephanie will help me with. Because I like to think about money. And with the name Franklin, uh, this is Franklin with $100 bills on it. Because what we're going to talk about is money. And as we talked about already, allocating money in a different way, potentially. So in case I'm having a bad hair day, this takes care of all kinds, much more hair than I have. But uh, we're going to talk the business case, we're going to talk about strategies for improving health outcomes and then take some questions. I think when you have a health problem, all of us, you know, are clinicians at various levels. And it's important that we deliver health care. Just as we were talking about in an ICU, you want those critical care docs there doing what they do so well. And you want that for the newborn intensive care unit. You want that for the cardiac surgery care unit. You need that for the general pediatric population. So you do need excellent health care. 
At the same time, that needs to be supported by a whole public health structure that provides public health as well. And that's much more than just simple vaccinations and things like that. And my feeling is, it's much better. My old friend Harriet Cloud, I haven't seen her in a while. How are you doing, Harriet? Good. You're late. No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't breakfast here until 9 o'clock. Harriet's an old friend. Harriet's been, been here much, even longer than I have at UAB, so, and still active. Uh, you still playing tennis, Harriet? Yes. Good. It's amazing. Uh, do they have a league for people over 90? Tennis league? Do they have a, do they have a tennis league? Yeah, yeah. They do, okay. So, Harriet goes back to internship in what, 1948 or something? No. When? Internship didn't start until uh, uh, the late, in the 50s. Okay. And that's when you were at Hopkins? I, was work, I worked in public health from 58 to 68, but we always had interns for a yeah. month at least in public health. Okay. So Harriet's been a real leader in, for many years. Uh, so it's a combination of combining health care and if you want to grab a problem, you want to catch a basketball, unless you have, you know, an enormous sort of claw, you need to grab it with two hands. So every health care problem should be grabbed with two hands. So this refers, actually, what you saw a little bit, that there's a socioeconomic health gradient. Um, you can start with poverty and deprivation. You can talk about the physical environment poor access to health care services and good housing, limited opportunities for education, stigma and discrimination through unemployment and unhealthy work. Everyone has a health burden to push. The job in public health is to lower the height of that, that fulcrum so that more people can be successful. And there are too many people in our country who have all those things stacked against them. It's a complex diagram, but it shows you that there are levels, whether we think about society, the environment, the emotional environment, or our health behaviors. All the time we think about health behaviors, we think about those in isolation, we think about uh, what we eat, we think about how active we are, we think about how sedentary we are, and then we try and modify those. And the challenge is very simple, that people then who have some of these adverse behaviors are depressed, as you know. they're anxious, they can be isolated. You can't help somebody if they're feeling terribly alone uh, without the support, whether they be those, that LBGTQ population, or they be the obese patient, or the diabetic patient, or the asthmatic. You have to think about those issues. And then you get out to larger social issues. You know, people obviously exist in families. There's a whole bunch of families that have conflict and disruptive parenting. There are social issues in terms of, there's low cohesion and trust in our whole community now, nationally and otherwise, internationally. And then you have people living in physical environments with high rates of decay, crime, and access issues. And then further out on the society level, you have issues of poverty, injustice, discrimination. So you have to think about that patient nested in those particular environments, and they all interact. So I'm taking, gonna take you through a patient, uh, and Stephanie now does that uh, all, every Friday, typically. So who's doing it today, Stephanie? Anfield. Oh, okay. All right, so Stephanie runs our obesity clinic that we started some years ago. Um, there's a patient, Tamika Oaks, that we saw for a number of years, or followed for a number of years. African-American female referred for obesity. At age 11, she had a BMI of 42. And as you know, we use in pediatrics the 95th percentile for a BMI, which is, of course, a measure of weight over height. And that would have been 23 and a half. So she was vastly obese. She had started into puberty. She had insulin resistance. 
And some of the things we see with the metabolic syndrome, that is high triglycerides, low HDL. Mother and grandmother had type 2 diabetes. So we don't need to have a whole um, genetic testing to predict whether she's going to have diabetes or not. She's already very obese and she has a family, a strong family history of type 2 diabetes. So you don't have to do a whole bunch of genetic profiling. We did lifestyle and activity counseling as we typically do and all along the way we basically failed. At age 14 her BMI was almost 46, age 18, 51 and then pre-pregnancy she reported her weight was over 300 pounds. Gestational diabetes, she had adequate, she got adequate prenatal care, and she had a newborn male who was about eight pounds, six ounces. And she's a single mother. So as you know, we use this scale for pediatric obesity, which you can find as the BMI over the 95th percentile of a person of the same age and gender. Her medical history is that she was born about six weeks early. Her mother did not take, uh, did not recall her birth weight. Her mother was 17 when Tamika was born. Now one of the positive things going on in public health now is we vastly reduce the rate of teen pregnancy. And this is one of the great advances in uh, public health and whether that's related to contraception or increased availability of abortion but it's probably increased availability of contraception, which is what we would like to do, is, is delay pregnancy until uh, these young ladies finish high school at least. Tamika's dad was in the area but not involved, and we talked about transgenerational obesity and diabetes. She resides in Inslee, which those of you who, who know uh, Birmingham know is a very poor area going west on I-20 from downtown. Um, she left Jackson Olin High School after the 10th grade and Jackson Olin High School is one of the six out of seven Birmingham high schools that are failing. The only one that's not failing is a magnet school, Ramsey. And the, the graduation rate in Jackson Olin is about 53 percent. She plans to complete her GD, GED when Dewan starts Head Start. She's not currently working outside the home, but looking. And she says taking care of her infant is a lot of work. She tires easily and her feet hurt. Let's talk about obesity outcomes and its distribution. One of the things that we're seeing is we've done a great job in public health with changing diet, convincing people to stop smoking. So smoking is much less socially acceptable behavior than it was. We've gotten better about treating hypertension. And so the rate of cardiovascular disease, whether you talk about coronary heart disease, that is heart attacks typically, or you talk about strokes, which is cerebrovascular disease, have decreased enormously. They're down by 60% uh, over the last 50 years or so. At the same time, we've seen the emergence of diabetes, type 2 diabetes related to the epidemic of obesity all across the age range. And so, as I mentioned yesterday, Gilda Radner, one of my old friends from Saturday Night Live, would always say, if it's not one thing, it's another. So we sort of trade it, this advances in cardiovascular disease, with a rising rate of, of diabetes and obesity. So we'd even have lower cardiovascular disease if we hadn't had the emergence of this epidemic. Diabetes is so tightly, type 2 diabetes is so tightly related to BMI that essentially 90% of diabetes, type 2 diabetes, adult onset diabetes, is related to obesity. So you can't even think about diabetes in adults without thinking about obesity. Now women are, at any given BMI, at higher risk for developing diabetes. So one quick question would be, why is that? Why do women have, at any given BMI, a higher risk of diabetes? So who wants to answer that before I call on somebody? 
Okay, let's target the one male in the audience here. Why do women have higher rates of diabetes at any given BMI, you know, which is a measure of weight for height? Would it be because of gestational diabetes? Well, women have it whether the gestational diabetes represents the same problem at some level. The story is women are fatter than men. Uh, you know, it's not always true, but men, you know, as they go through puberty, you know, males deposit more muscle than women do, and women deposit more fat. Now, why would a woman deposit more fat, do you think? Yeah, to carry babies for fertility and be able to, to sustain a pregnancy. And the same goes with insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is how you grow the baby in the last trimester. The fuel is not going into the mother, it's flooding across the placenta into the baby, and that's when most of the weight gain occurs during pregnancy. So there's a physiological reason. So what do you know about women who don't have all that fat? Right. I mean, that's sort of the, you know, the athlete's triad, the, or the ballet dancer's triad, or what you see with anorexia. You know, they lose their periods. So it makes sense, you know, that woman is not ready to reproduce, that, that woman. Okay, now where is obesity concentrated in the country? We mentioned that a little bit during the breakfast discussion. Well, we're in the midst of the highest area of obesity in the country, and that is um, Mississippi, Alabama. And Sydney was asking me, you know, what do I know as differences between Alabama and Mississippi? Not a whole hell of a lot, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking about different sizes of elephants. I mean, it's really very... And I did mention that one of the things I learned when I was in New Orleans for five years before coming up here in 1990 is that whenever you mention a health care statistic in Louisiana, you can say, thank God for Mississippi. And that's what you always mention. Now Mississippi is doing better than Alabama is educationally and also uh, from a health point of view in some respects, but they're still projected to have more. So, and then you can throw in Arkansas. The real outlier here, of course, is Georgia, uh, which is not. And then you have states like the West with Colorado and Utah where the rates of obesity are much less. So anybody who says we can't do something about obesity in the United States. All they have to do is look at the map and see that the rates are, yes, obesity rates have been going up over the years in all the states, but there are states that have a rate of obesity 35% less than, the, than Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas, and Louisiana. So there are things you can do within the American diet. It's not, it's not hopeless. Somehow people in Colorado uh, have figured out what to do, and that is they go outside and they walk. What's going to happen over the next number of years? In Alabama, 54%, it might be 40% now, but 54% of obese, of, of adults will be obese in 2030. So if you're thin or a normal weight in Alabama, you're going to be in a minority. And that's true, so yeah, Mississippi will still be out ahead of us at about 60-65%, but it's going to just become a worse and worse problem. Now who loves obesity? Tell me, what group in the United States loves obesity? Again, a simple question. What would you say? Who loves obesity? Who loves having a population of patients who are all diabetic. What's that? Doctors? Doctors? Yeah. Pharmaceutical firms. I mean, diabetics in hospitals. Diabetics cost you twice per person. You know, the, the amount of money for medical care each year. I mean, you know, it's wise to treat them all with a statin, an antihypertensive, the insulin, insulin sensitizers, et cetera. But it's, it's a wonderful, if you were going to invest in anything, invest in diabetes. 
Okay. <clears throat> now, what's the age-adjusted sort of percentage among adults? In the U.S., for diabetes, it's about one out of every 11 people has diabetes among adults. In Alabama, it's one out of every eight people, as it is in Jefferson County. So we have about 30% higher rates of diabetes in Birmingham and uh, Jefferson County than does the rest of the country. We know if we look at counties that there's a distinct relationship between uh, obesity and diabetes. There's a distinct relationship between being sedentary and obesity and sedentary and diabetes. And you realize that this is county data. You know, let's just take Jefferson County as an example. Jefferson County has Mountain Brook, Homewood, and then has Birmingham City. So you, when you're looking at an income, you're looking at a mixed group. If you start focusing on individual census tracts, this relationship would look very strong, even stronger than it is. Now, why did Tamika Oaks fail to lose weight? Well, she did not adhere to the diet and the activity plan, did not keep follow-up visits. Family was not involved and was not supportive. Family was unwilling to change their diet, because it always has to be a family program. And we don't have the best counseling skills. Um, so who can we blame and shame? And we always got to sort of shame somebody uh, into this game we play. So what did we miss? Well, we all try and buff up our medical care, but we put the responsibility back on the patient and the family and say, well, they didn't do it. So can we blame them? Well, place matters. Tamika's from Inslee. So where you live, work, and play. So this is like a typical admission form at Children's when you come into the clinic. And I would say, what date after the patient's name, age, and chief complaint is the most important data on that form? If you were in healthcare delivery, you would say insurance information. Because that's what they're always thinking about. Most of this is about collecting. So the first thing I got asked the other day when I was going to go schedule a routine follow-up colonoscopy five years after the last one was, you know, what health care insurance firm you have. It's just like we're not scheduling it until we know that you can pay. To me, the most important information is where they live, and that informs on the neighborhood context, and context counts and is critical for patient care. But most of the time, we don't even think about that. We know somebody's from Birmingham, or they're from, uh, you know, Wetumpka, or they're from Montgomery, or they're from Huntsville. We don't really know anything about their neighborhood. So one of the people from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation said, when it comes to health, your zip code matters more than your genetic code. So we're all talking about personalized medicine, we're all talking about genetic analysis and the power of that, but it still matters more where you live. Um, now, unfortunately, and I eliminated a lot of information about Ensley because of the limitation on time, but we can talk about what we call a composite in index of opportunity. You know, everybody needs, in my mind, a fair opportunity. If we look at whites versus blacks in the U.S., blacks and typically have, were there any measure, this composite, where they put all these measures together, like children who live in families with poverty, two-parent households, whether the health care provider, the homeowner has a high school diploma. These are all measures in your school, etc. Blacks in, in, in the U.S. in general have about half the opportunity as whites do. In Alabama, whites even have lower than they do nationally, as do blacks, but we're really not discriminating any more than the rest of the country does because blacks versus whites nationally have 49% and in Alabama it's 46% of the opportunity. So in general, blacks have less opportunity in the U.S. Just one measure of a health disparity. Let's look at infant mortality. As you know, infant mortality is much higher in the U.S. than in about 20 or 30 other countries. 
But let's look at, at the last 10 years or so, or through 2016. You can see U.S. blacks have a rate, and this is a rate per thousand live births, of about 11 infants dying in the first year of life if you're black, and about five infants dying in the U.S. if you're white. But across all those years, Alabama blacks do worse than they do nationally, with 15 versus 11, and Alabama whites do less well than do U.S. Uh, whites in general. So our infant mortality is higher than it is nationally, and it's higher for blacks than it is for whites, and that's also true. So the same numbers that you saw for composite index of opportunity is reflected here in an outstanding healthcare statistic, which is infant mortality. So why are some people healthier than others? We can ask that question. Um, well, upstream influences on health, and you, can, you consider the causes of the causes. So you can say Johnny comes in with an infection. Now, why did he have an infection? Well, his parents took him in late. But why? Well, they had problems with health care access. But how did he cut his leg playing? Well, he was playing in a lot with, you know, some broken metal in it. So why was he playing there? Because his parents live in a poor neighborhood. So you keep asking what a little toddler does, which is why, 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 and then you get a root cause analysis. So you have to examine, do a social examination. What's the place of the patient in the population in the place? So we don't fixate on an individual piece. As I said yesterday, we fixate on the entire thing. So let's look at these numbers. If I were to ask you, what is the main determinant of health care outcomes? What would you say for the lady here with a nice scarf? What's the main thing that determines why somebody has greater health than another person? Their socioeconomic status. That's what we, always, that's what we say. But most of the time, what do providers say? It's health care. It's what we're doing there in clinic. It's, it's the availability of the medications we have, et cetera. But that doesn't explain the variation. So a lot of it is socioeconomic factors, education, employment, income, family support, and community safety. And then the physical environment, which is also safety, but it's air and water quality, housing, and transit. Those factors, independent of clinical care and independent of health care behaviors explain 50% of the difference. And then if you threw in healthcare behaviors, which also have a socioeconomic uh, impact, where we talk about diet, tobacco, alcohol, sexual activity, that has, and clinical care, all the things that we've been trained to do, and all the things that I did for so many years, 40 or 50 years of pediatric care, accounts for about 20% of the difference in healthcare outcomes. It's not to say it's not important, but it's a little bit late in the game, typically. Oops, sorry. So let's talk about diabetes. You know, they're so tightly related. You can look downstream. We talk about the disability, disease, death, obesity, cardiovascular disease, all these impacts of, of obesity. And we all focus on diet, activity, and how sedentary people are. Going back upstream, we can look at neighborhood deficits. We oftentimes talk about availability of food supermarkets, playgrounds, unsafe environments, blighted neighborhoods. Lack of education, lack of opportunity for jobs, transportation. We can go further up. You know, one of the issues is people feel isolated. They don't feel included in the society. So that's ostracism, isolation. Isolation is a tremendous issue now, even internationally. If you ask people, what's the biggest issue? For so many people, it's the fact that they feel isolated. It has nothing to do with how many friends you have on Facebook or whatever. High rates of depression, high rates of despair, as, as Marissa Lidisky talked about, you know, the opposite of despair is hope. A lot of people no longer have much hope. 
There's stress, there's anxiety, there's fear, there's insecurity. A lot of people have, are insecure about their finances. And then further upstream, we have problems with social cohesion, which is people getting together. In individuals, there's issues with trust and social norms. And then you have this, this issue of opportunity. So why don't we fix the problem? We know what the problem is. Why don't we fix it? Is it just more money? Is it that we don't know what to do? Is it that we don't want to do it? Why don't we do it? And does awareness, maybe, every, maybe not everybody knows what you all know about nutrition and health. So maybe everybody just needs more nutrition information. And that's what we have to give them. We have to tell them what a healthy diet is. We now have added sugars on the nutrition label, so they should be looking at that and you know, really cutting back on added sugars. And we should put stop signs on the front of the package, et cetera. So does awareness change our attitudes? Can we even discuss this problem without fighting about it? Well, and we have to dig deeper. So here's a, just a cartoon that shows this guy sitting isolated on this little island. And he's saying, day 44, still stranded with nothing but flat, empty water as far as one can see. And what he doesn't see is all the things going on underneath. So it's a classic sort of iceberg or isolated mountain. Every island, of course, is, is really a little mountain. So what happens with awareness? Is there a common understanding? If everybody understood it's, it's healthy eating, it's healthy uh, activity. No. We separate. So we're separated really by our cultural values. So the more information hypothesis, which is, you know, need more information, please, or need no more information, too much information. So I think the more information hypothesis is BS. The problem is that it fails to explain polarization over many issues. So it isn't just a matter of giving people more information. So who and what we blame comes from our own deep cultural values. So although there are associations between attributions of responsibility, that is who's to blame or what's to blame, and support for social remedies, they're partly due to our political views, you know, whether you're red or blue or purple or whatever. They persist even when you control for partisanship, political ideology, and socioeconomic status. So, so a prominent lawyer at the Yale Law School calls this the cultural worldview thesis. That cultural cognition of risk is our tendency of individuals to form risk perceptions that are close to our inherent values. And that we form these risk perceptions and they reflect and reinforce our own views. So there's a lot of confirmation bias. So how did he separate people? Well, he separates people on these two axes. The horizontal axis being sort of the individualism versus communitarian. So do we see people all as individuals? That is where it's all a meritocracy. That our life inclines us towards a highly competitive view People are expected to fend for themselves without any collective assistance or interference. So I'm a physician, I got a PhD in nutrition, and I earned all that. Well, the answer is no. Yeah, I went to those schools, but I had the opportunity from my father, who was a physician, and my mother was a pharmacist, for a good education. A lot of people in my neighborhood didn't have that opportunity. So yeah. We had a bit of a leg up. Now, so is it all individual? Or do we view people in more of a strong group orientation, where we see that we're really all in this together? And that mode of social order promotes values of solidarity rather than competitiveness. Now, the other axis is whether we organize ourselves almost into a caste and class system, where there's this grid of hierarchy. You know, the people with more degrees, the lawyers, the Jeff Bezoses of the world, etc., they are high ups. And then you have 
doctors and lawyers and bankers, and then you have ordinary middle management, and then you have a whole bunch of uh, service people, whether you see them um, you know, cleaning up in the, in the room with earlier here in the morning, or whether you see them at Starbucks or where you see them. So you can value your position in this hierarchy and defend it, or you can have a more egalitarian view where no one's prevented from participating in any social role because of the wrong class. We favor people our own group. So these are peeps. You know, we'll be coming up on Mardi Gras, I guess, this Tuesday. And then um, 40 days of giving up something. And then we'll have uh, Easter. And so all the peeps will be out there. But now they have peeps on a year-round basis. I think we have Christmas peeps and everything else. Who here doesn't know peeps? Who here doesn't like peeps? Oh, come on. <laughs> what do you got against marshmallow? <laughs> I think I'm speaking to the wrong crowd. I better leave <laughs> at this point. I like peeps. OK, so the, the purple peeps are saying, like, oh my gosh, did you hear about the oranges? And the oranges were saying, I remember, I was blue. Psh, that was so lame. Those blue and purple peeps are wannabes. And the blue folks are saying, look at those purple and orange peeps. They're so ugly. Yeah, they're so weird. So we all have this in-group bias. And so we have a cockfight, or can we communicate across the chasm? Can my peeps talk with your peeps without pecking each other to death? That's the challenge. So there has been work on messages that work. You know, we have beliefs. That, what are the beliefs of the general public? Well, they believe that individuals are primarily responsible for their own health behaviors. They believe that medical care is the primary determinant of health. Yet they recognize that socioeconomic determinants of health and government's role to improve access to health care, education, and other associated. So we recognize some of that. I mean, we have a public education system. So the messaging strategy has to take into account the beliefs of the general public. So we acknowledge the role for individual decisions. So yeah, people are pushing that burden. They still have to push that burden. But we have to refute the idea that individual behavior and medical care alone cause poor health. We have to emphasize that unemployment, race discrimination, structural racism, and poverty shape individual behaviors and medical care by limiting, constraining our choices due to a lack of resources and poor neighborhood environments, and they contribute. So we have to always have that big but, and I'm not spelling that B-U-T-T, -T, but more just B-U-T, that yes, we have to acknowledge these things, but a change as well. So use these about opportunities. A fair chance for good health. These are messages that resonate with almost all Americans, which is fair chance for good health. Fair opportunities for better health choices. Give people a fair shot in all communities. Enable people to choose the right path. And give tools to make better decisions. Those messages work with people because inherently we want to be fair and we want people to have opportunity. That's what's inherent in the US. We're not going to give everybody the same amount of money, the same housing, the same everything. You know, so that's not going to, you don't want to talk to people about ending disparities or that what they're doing, what they're suggesting is unjust or expressing outrage or that it's immoral. There's no way to convince people or to enable people to, to come to common ground. So <clears throat> there's a view of targeted universalism, but basically this is suggesting that it's inclusive Yet, those, yet you target those, as I mentioned earlier, who are most marginalized and falling behind. So it's something we do in medical care every day. We don't deliver the exact same care to anybody. We give them the medical care that they need. So we stratify their risk. We do that with cardiovascular disease. We do that with almost everything. Um, and we make sure the patient has access to the antibiotic, et cetera. And you want some transformation. Transformation means we really need to change the system that are existing. 
So we, you know, we are the same in many respects, all of us as human beings. But, and that's why we can dialogue with one another. But because we're different in some respects, dialogue is essential. So what's an unproductive way to talk about race? Well, you don't frame it around what's fair. You don't focus on who or what is responsible for the current inequities. Or you don't focus on exceptional individuals. There are exceptional individuals among every race ethnic group who have done enormously well, but that doesn't speak to the average person. What's productive is to reinforce the belief of the opportunity for all, assert that a system flaws hurt everyone, so we're all hurt, and I'll show you some economics to support that, is steer the conversation towards results, that we want people to have a quality education. We want them to be able to finish high school, because that's the biggest predictor of risk of incarceration. We talk about where systems we all rely upon break down and how we can fix those systems. Just like anybody who knows Birmingham knows that we have a broken educational system in the city of Birmingham. Yet we all live in over the mountain communities. When I came here in 1990 and talked about where to live, everybody said, live over the mountain. That was you know, what everybody told me. And they're still true. Now maybe you can live going north from Birmingham, but nobody's living in Birmingham anymore, you know, who would have the income to move further out. The business case for racial equity. I mean, is there a business case? Why do I wear this stupid money hat? Because I believe in money. But no, I think that, that it's dollars and cents make sense. So if we were to close the educational gap in an achievement, it would be very, very beneficial to produce economic, human, and social gains. In fact, it would be worth $2.3 trillion. Let me ask somebody, what's the relationship between a million and a billion? I know it's not personally relevant, but for this young lady, what's, how many millions go into making a billion? A thousand. So, you know, somebody who has a billion dollars has a thousand millions. Now, what about a trillion? From a million? No, from, let's go from a billion. To a trillion? Uh -huh. A thousand? Yeah, it's again a thousand. So you can see that somebody like Jeff Bezos, who's worth, we'll say, $130 billion, has 130,000 millions. That's a lot of money. So who bought anything on Amazon today? <laughs> or in the past week? Who, how many people have bought things on Amazon in the past week? Almost as many people as people who don't like marshmallows. <laughs> but, but I take it you didn't order peeps. So what did you order on Amazon? Me? Well, there's this lady in the striped shirt. What did you order? I did not order. You didn't? <laughs> What are you, on American? <laughs> What'd you order? Shampoo. <laughs> yeah. I, if I want to raise my wife's hairs on her back, all I have to do is whenever she says, oh, we need some so-and-so, and I say, I can order it online. <laughs> she still likes to go shopping some places, but so I always say that just to irritate the hell out of her. And I'm just, <laughs> So we'd save $2.3 trillion by 2050 if we raise the educational achievement of African Americans and Hispanics to the same level as whites. Return on investment, which is mean for every dollar you put in, you get $13 back in education. So a hell of a good return on investment. And there are a number of jurisdictions in the U.S. that have already implemented inclusionary residential zoning practices. As everybody knows, residential segregation or separation is the whole explanation for why schools are so bad or good. People want to live in Mountain Brook. Where did you have your children? Uh, in Homewood? Yeah. I mean, in Bluff Park. Bluff Park. Well, that's 
Hoover. It was not incorporated. It wasn't incorporated at that time, yeah. Now it's part of Hoover. But the bottom line is, is that, you know, people who are here in town typically use those school systems. And that's all residentially determined. We have 13 different school systems here in Birmingham. That's all the impact of what happened after we eliminated segregation. You know, at that time, there were 75,000 students in the Birmingham city school system. Now there are about 23,000. The same goes with health care. You know, health care costs would drop enormously because education is a big predictor of your health. So, what are the potential strategies you might suggest? Well, first of all, I focus a lot on education. I think for pre-K, education for all. I think the children who are falling behind, who we stage kids even in seventh grade and tenth grade in proficiency levels. So if you're at proficiency one and two, which means you're the lowest levels, we have to do something special for those children. So I would suggest tutoring and after school and even summer sessions for children who are falling behind, because those are the kids we can move ahead. Because if you're low, if you can't read very well by the time you're in fourth grade, you're, you're going to drop out of high school. And if you do that, that's the biggest predictor of who's going to go to jail. And so it's pretty clear what education can do for you. Then you improve school engagement with children and families. And then you do community programs to improve the physical, social, and family environments. So here are some suggestions, maybe responses to my suggestions. So I ask you a quiz. What do you say when you have heard this bull before? Many of you have heard this before. So, so this is the um, money question today. So I need an answer. So what do you say when you have heard this bull before? Come on, give me some answers. Give me some suggestions. You say deja vu? It could be deja. I'm going to ask you which is your favorite because I've got to fix this slide. Deja poo or deja number two? So who votes for deja vu? Who votes for deja vu? Looks like that's pulling out ahead. Who votes for deja number two? Just Stephanie in the back. As a gastroenterologist in pediatrics, I was always sort of irritated that our focus, which was a lot of constipation and other stooling problems, was considered number two. I really push that we'd be number one, you know? But, so deja vu is when you know you've experienced this bull before. Uh, and this is another suggestion I might get on the feedback. I wish people came with a 30-second trailer so I can see what I'm getting myself into. So your evaluations, well, maybe you'll suggest uh, that uh, I generate a meadow muffin here. So, so love the hard questions, prefer the easy ones. You probably have run over time or whatever, but so we'll take a question or two. Yes, ma'am. Health for every size, yes. yes. Are you familiar? No. Okay. Well, basically, like, we're taught that if someone is at a higher BMI, that that's okay. And I love that. But I was just wondering, like, what's a doctor's opinion on that since the relation to diabetes? Yeah, it's a good, it's a very good question. Um, I think it fits in general with the idea that we don't want people to feel badly. We don't want to stigmatize people. We don't want to discriminate against people. But on the end, there's no doubt that there is a genetic basis for obesity, just like there is for height. You know, if you're tall, chances are you had tall parents, and we can predict that. You know, I was never going to, you know, be a starting lineman for the University of Alabama. You know, that's just not in my family, those kinds of sizes, those kinds of uh, speeds, et cetera. 
So yeah, there, there's, there are genetic bases for obesity. Having said that, everybody can play around with their range. That range of about 10% in your BMI can reduce your risk of diabetes by 50 or 70% or more. So I want everybody to play on the lower side of their genetic potential. And you can help people facilitate, you know, getting access to healthier foods, access to healthier environments for activity. And everybody can make small changes. We're not all going to be the same size. So I don't think there's health, at, I think there's health at every genetic potential. I don't think there's health at every single size. But I don't think you should stigmatize somebody about that. But we do. You know, we do that all the time in jobs. We do that all the time in, in almost everything else. I mean, there's no doubt that physical appearance makes a tremendous difference in who gets to go where. Good question. Other questions? Yes? How do you evaluate the success of the programs that we've had since the 60s, like the food stamp, like SNAP, which is yeah. called food stamps. Uh, we've had, uh, since the 70s, we've had WIC. We have many programs that were designed to improve health, and yet we have had not we failed. Totally good outcome. So, how do you evaluate why those programs weren't successful? Yeah. So, you know, she offers the important perspective that you know we've had a version of food stamps since basically the 1940s and 50s. You know, WIC came in with a lot of the other programs in about the 1960s, typically in the 70s. What's the evaluation? I think that SNA WIC has done a better job and has had more successful outcomes since they've gone to subsidizing fruits and vegetables. And they have some success with at least the people who are using WIC maybe being thinner than the kids who weren't using WIC. I think SNAP has improved food insecurity in that people are now more food secure. That was the basis of it. It started out because, you know, during World War II, so many people who came in, particularly from the South, were very malnourished and were not ready to be soldiers. And so somebody said, well, we ought to do a nutrition surveillance study. And they started doing nutrition surveillance studies. And they figured out that there were a tremendous number of people who were undernourished in the US. And we had these vast surpluses, and they decided to dedicate the vast surpluses to basically food stamps. So it has done, it's been good from that point of view. It's basically an income transfer program because you now you get money to support your food and you can spend your money somewhere else. So it's also relieved some poverty. At the same time, we have enormous rates of obesity. So what's the answer? The politically um, unpopular suggestion is that we tax the hell out of unhealthy foods. You know, and it's been demonstrated. If you make unhealthy foods 25% less affordable for people so that when they use their coupons, their EPT cards, they basically have to use more of it to pay for the unhealthy foods. So what was a dollar before, now they pay a dollar and a quarter for. And then you make the food that previously, the healthy foods that cost a dollar, you make cost 75 cents. Then that starts shaping people's behavior. The other thing we do much better in WIC, I think, than we do in the SNAP program, is we do nutrition counseling, right? There's more nutrition counseling, I think, in Working, I was actually the only nutritionist at the health department. 
because this was before WIG. But we formed a nutrition council, and we had people from various agencies that had anything to do with food and nutrition. And we, and we uh, started a nutrition education program in the housing projects where the grocery stores donated food to us and we prepared it, gave out recipes, had, and then would give supplemental food to the, pair, uh, the women to take home sure. and cook for their neighbors and, and do some education themselves. And actually, it was pretty, it was really a pretty successful program. And as a result of that, then, uh, USDA decided to do some of that themselves out in the communities. But I don't think it's ever been, I think it's hard to sustain that kind of education unless you are going to employ some people to do it. Yeah, they cut back a lot on SNAP education. You know, I had a student who went to do SNAP education up in Duluth, Minnesota, really bright and talented person, and after a year she lost her job because of cutbacks. And so I think, yeah, I think WIC has more mandated counseling that I'm aware of than does SNAP. And a lot of people just go and get their, their you know, EBT card, electronic benefit card, and then do nothing from a nutrition point of view. And so I think it's, I think you can do subsidies with, with subsidies and penalties. I think you can do more education. I think you can do greater availability in supermarkets. But I think just to give people, and the only limitation is pre-prepared food and tobacco and alcohol that they can't use their, their EBT card with. I think there ought to be more restrictions. And then people say, well, this is discriminatory. But I think the fact is, is that yes, there are people, and I think even my own bias is that, yeah, we talk about food insecurity. The real people who need it the most are the very food insecure. And if you ever look at that scale that they use, it's the people who have really had to miss meals, the people who have really had to cut back, anybody who's lost weight. That's the very food insecure. That's about two or three percent of the people in the United States. They need a lot of work. The regular food insecure person, which is up to 16 percent of Americans, it's gone down a little bit now post-recession, they're nowhere near the uh, issues from a nutritional point of view of the other folks. And so I think you have to understand what the value of the program is, and we're not doing anything. And there's no doubt, I mean, there's data now that says that the, that the SNAP recipients are getting more chronic disease than people who would qualify for SNAP who are not on it. So there's some suggestion that, that SNAP is related to some of these chronic diseases we're seeing. It's always hard to control for that, but in, in analyses, that's what it's suggesting. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, please. Um, so you're talking about like cost of food, for, like healthy versus unhealthy, and making the processed unhealthy foods more expensive, and making things like produce less expensive and affordable. So how, like on a, I guess, financial standpoint from the companies, um, you know, like produce is more expensive to grow and produce than processed food is, so how do you kind of like combat that? I mean, how can the food companies do okay with this? I don't think they're hurting at all, and I don't think they will hurt. I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff that makes, you know, you can, if you start to factor in things beyond just, you know, if you, if you give people, the companies, for instance, could get subsidies, or the grower of the fruits and vegetables and the processor and getting them to the supermarket, if they were subsidized, which would make sense from a healthcare point of view, See, the problem is we keep all these isolated silos, you know, health, agriculture, nutrition, et cetera, education, all in their own silos. But if we realize that, as I suggested earlier, you could transfer money from one sector to another, if you transferred some of the money that goes into health to agriculture to produce more fruits and vegetables, 
then it becomes very effective to do that. So I think, yeah, you can, you can move monies around and do some of that. Uh, processed food is very cheap. I mean, it does involve a lot of processing, but it's very cheap because all we're doing is adding fat and sugar. Absolutely. That's where I start out. I think we pay attention to you know, our own practices and processes, but um, we tend to write off policies. Why do we write off policies? And that's because it has the word politics in it. You know, and most people are sort of getting disgusted with politics. So there's a question there in the back. That'll be the last question. Yes. So the question is, is it really more than money? And I think there's no doubt about it. You know, there are concepts. There's a, a, a lawyer at, at UC Berkeley who I was reading just about yesterday. And he talks about the concept, you know, takes inclusion to a different level. He talks about otherness, which is, you know, all the other people. So we get into these we, them, versus belongingness was we all belong together in our society. So I think there's no doubt that structural racism, discrimination, all affect opportunities. We see that day in and day out. Just as I showed you, the blacks are doing less well in the U.S. in this composite measure of index, and they're doing less well in Alabama, both whites and blacks, than they are nationally. You know, so when you start seeing these relationships, you have to say, well, what's the connection? What, how does the system really work? And it's very clear that, that residential segregation is, where are you from? Where do you live? Yeah. I'm from Mexico. Mexico, okay. Yeah, I mean, Mexico has done things with, with taxes on sugar-sweetened beverages, right? Yes. And it's had an impact. Among low-income people, they're consuming less sugar-sweetened beverages. So yeah, I mean, Mexico is a good example of you know, what the power of some of these things are. And yet we have trouble putting real significant taxes on sugar-sweetened beverages. So I think, yeah, there's no doubt there's discrimination. And there's no doubt that a lot of this is embedded in society. And I think we also have to admit that many of us were brought up with certain views of groups. So, you know, we're conflicted because there's a whole side of me, for instance, that understands these issues of social justice, but there are whole sides of me that were brought up, you know, in a very conservative, you know, probably discriminatory uh, environment. And so I think that, yeah, I think we have to recognize that in ourselves. And we separate people by classes. Yes, Stephanie? I think what Stephanie says is entirely correct. I mean, we're starting to understand that biologically where you look at inflammatory markers. There's also epigenetics. You know, we used to think that, yeah, you had this DNA and then that just played through. We now know that a lot of experiences in utero have an impact on mediators of how your genes are read out. And so those are some, we've demonstrated in some studies we've done here in Birmingham, that kids who grow up in stressful environments have epigenetic changes in how they respond to stress hormones, like cortisol. 
So yeah, it's present even in our own environment. The other thing is what we talk about is the allostatic load, which is this long-term impact, you know, of wearing down on people. You know, it's sort of wear and tear. And if you've lived in these environments and you've been there all the time and you've been highly stressed and you worry, you discriminate, you have financial worries, etc. You don't you're not going to eat well. You can give them all the counseling you want. But you have to understand that people are burdened and that the longer you carry that burden, the more it wears you down. So I think, yeah, there are long-term influences. All right, let's, I think we're going to take a break, I guess. Is that what's next? All right. Thank you all.